Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the great room at the RSA. Uh, I'm Shona Manson. I am Assistant Director for Culture and Creative Industries for the Mayor of London and I'm a proud trustee of the RSA and it's a great delight to welcome you here this evening for this fantastic event, the 2021 RDI <coughs> Ceremony and Address. We are live streaming the event, so a warm welcome to all our online viewers at home. Uh, if you'd like to join in the conversation on the Twitter, and this includes you in the room, uh, please do use hashtag RSARDI. There's never been a more important time to celebrate design and how it helps us to imagine and create an alternative, better future. Across the world, we face multiple complex challenges and they're interrelated, so we need design solutions to help meet the critical needs of our planet and our people. The importance of recognising design excellence is stewarded by the RSA. The titles of royal designers for industry are awarded annually across disciplines to those who have achieved sustained design excellence of significant benefit to society and ecology. Established in 1936, the title RDI remains the highest accolade for designers in the UK. This year, we're delighted to recognise nine new Royal Designers for Industry and four new Honorary Royal Designers for Industry. We look forward to ongoing collaboration with the RDI faculty across the RSA's impact programmes and with our community of designers in the RSA Fellowship in support of our mission of using design to unite people and ideas to resolve the challenges of our time. In addition to celebrating the, R the RDI's achievements tonight, it's really important that we acknowledge the next generation of designers who are committed to using their skills to tackle society's challenges. We're delighted to have some of this year's talented RSA Student Design Award winners here with us this evening. Now in its 98th year, and I'm sure you'll agree that is incredible, the RSA Student Design Awards is an open innovation challenge for university students and recent graduates. Each year, the RSA works closely with a range of partners uh, from different sectors, including Philips, the Marketing Trust, the Centre for Aging Better, and Twitter. They create a set of design briefs that challenge emerging changemakers to address complex problems through design thinking. How might we design systems that provide seamless and cost-effective access to quality health services for underserved communities? How might we encourage people and communities to think and act for the long term? Or apply biomimicry to create textiles, processes or systems that enhance nature. I'm sure you'll agree they are no small uh, challenges. And those are just a few of them posed by the eight design briefs in the past year's competition. We work with colleges and universities across the UK and around the world to embed the RSA briefs in their curricula. Many students who pass through this programme go on to use their skills uh, to transform the world we live in and indeed, some of them have had the honour of becoming a Royal Designer for Industry. I'm really pleased that we have three recent winners here with us tonight, and it's my great pleasure to share their winning work with you. Mariana Lordu won a brief, won an award for the brief A New Leaf. This brief asked students to think about how to use at local woodland resources to stimulate economic activity that's inclusive and sustainable. Mariana is a product design student from Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. She focused on Phytothora romorum, and someone in this room can correct me if that's wrong, hopefully, uh, an incurable plant disease affecting woodlands across the globe. She designed Potium a biodegradable plant pot made from infected tree waste material, converting it into a product with widespread commercial use. The panel was impressed by Mariana's professional presentation and by the depth of research and prototyping of the product itself. Turning a devastating plant disease into an opportunity to reuse excited the panel and they are interested to see this solution be developed further. 
The following two winners both responded in very different ways to the brief material world. This brief asked students to use biomimicry to create textiles, processes or systems that enhance nature. Katie Allen, graduate of the MA Fashion and Textiles Design Programme at Basbar University, submitted soil to soil knitwear, farm to finished product. Katie is a shepherd running a regenerative farming operation and clothing line called Loopy Ewes. Her, alter her alternate business model uses minimal, minimal textile production methods to create traceable, sustainable garments from a flock of rare breed sheep. The judges were impressed by Katie's dedication to her craft and her flock and her willingness to share her model with other producers. They felt that this model was exactly the kind of disruptive and system-shifting activity that's needed to move us towards a truly regenerative fashion future. The final winner, Kerry Cooper, tackled the material world brief in a completely different way. A graduate of Imperial College London Masters in Healthcare and Design, she designed a prototype for a biodegradable wound dressing that mimics strategies from nature to optimise healing. The bioplastic dressing that you see here mimics the texture of bamboo leaf to achieve the specific moisture wicking properties needed to allow for optimal healing of wounds. The panel found Kerry's work was extremely well researched, professionally presented and demonstrated an innovative uh, and impressive innovation that was unexpected but much needed. So I'd like to ask all of the very impressive RSA Student Design Awards winners who are here in the room with us to be upstanding so you can join me in congratulating them. Very well done. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so these very talented young designers will be showcasing their winning, winning projects in the Benjamin Franklin Room here tonight after this event. So I'd encourage everyone to go and speak with them uh, and about their work and what they gained from taking part in the RSA Student Design Awards. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. So we've got a great evening ahead of us. Uh, following the RDI presentations tonight, Tom Lloyd RDI uh, will be inaugurated as the new Master of the Royal Designers and then, according to tradition, Tom will give this year's RDI address. In a moment, I'll hand over to the outgoing Master of the Royal Designers, Mark Major RDI, who will invite the new members of the faculty to receive their diplomas. But before I do that, I'd like to thank Mark for working with the faculty and the RSA over the past two years, in particular with the enormous challenging context of a global pandemic, not something you thought you would be working through. Mark's work as Master RDI has focused on championing an increasing diversity of disciplines, backgrounds and geographies within the RDI faculty and amongst new members. We're thankful for his hard work and commitment to this mission and gratefully acknowledge the role of the RDI Master. I'd also like to take this moment to thank the Royal Designers for their ongoing commitment to the RSA. I'll now hand over to Mark Major. Thank you. Well, th th thank you, Shona. It's wonderful to be here. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> It really is. Uh, you know, last year was inevitably not to, not, not to be. Um, now, b before I start, uh, I would just like to take a moment and say goodbye uh, to some colleagues who we have lost since 2019. And, and I think it's fitting to honour them and their amazing work and contribution to design um, in the way in which is celebratory. So can I just, just ask for... Thank, thank, thank you. Now to introduce our new RDIs. Whilst we would normally expect to welcome up to six to seven designers, thanks to the generosity of the RSA, there are no less than 11 and one partnership to be announced. This increases our numbers and helps strengthen our faculty, but allows us to embrace an even greater diversity of disciplines. And after all, we are a multidisciplinary faculty. 
As Shona said, the title Royal Designer for Industry, or RDI, is awarded annually to the RSA by UK designers of all disciplines who have achieved sustained excellence, work of aesthetic value, and significant benefit to society. So welcome, new RDIs. I will read out a brief citation and then invite you onto the stage to collect your diploma. Stephen Appleby, for innovation in illustration. Anyone who reads a national newspaper will already know the work of Stephen Appleby. He is a singular talent. An illustrator, cartoonist and artist that has created funny and darkly philosophical comic strips about daily life for over 30 years. <laughs> His cartoons and drawings have been published in papers such as The Guardian, The Observer, The Sunday Telegraph and The NME, and further afield, The Frankfurter Al Allgemeine Zeitung and Die Zeit. Stephen has also written a comedy series for BBC Radio 4, had his character Captain Star animated for television, written and drawn over 30 books, exhibited prints and paintings in many exhibitions, created all the art and murals for the Royal Brompton Hospital Centre for Sleep, and has had his secret world adapted for a stage in the musical play Crocs in Frocks at the ICA. Often described as absurdist, his witty and intelligent observations offer a wry commentary on ordinary life. Its charm, its tedium, its secrets, its fantasies, all the while questioning its very purpose. Stephen's critically acclaimed war-winning graphic novel, Dragman, has been published in several countries, including France, where it won the Prix Special at the 48th International Comic Festival earlier this year. It tells a semi-autobiographical tale of a superhero who can fly when he dons women's clothing. Stephen, you are an example to us all, creatively and intellectually. Your work and humour makes our lives much the richer. Many congratulations on becoming a royal designer. Next, we come to Ilsa Crawford for innovation in interior design. Ilsa Crawford is one of the most influential interior designers of our time. She has created such seminal projects as Soho House New York, Et Hem in Stockholm, alongside furniture and products designed for brands such as IKEA, George Jensen and Vitra. Ilsa began her career in architecture before moving into publishing, becoming the launch editor for Elle Decoration which she turned into one of the world's most successful interior magazines. She set up her well-known practice, Studio Ilsa, over two decades ago. Ilsa is a true pioneer. She has always used design to enhance well-being in an ethical and responsible way, championing a highly sustainable approach. Alongside her beautifully crafted interiors, Ilsa has also brought design to less advantaged environments. By example, her transformation of a shabby community centre and soup kitchen into the vibrant and empowering Refettorio Felix. Ilsa is also a highly committed educator and author, founding the Man and Wellbeing Department at the Design Academy in Eindhoven over 20 years ago, when well-being had barely entered the design lexicon. Ilsa has won many awards and was recognised through an MBE in 2014 and a CBE earlier this year. Ilsa, you are an inspiration to us all in the way that your work has changed the perception of the environments we habit. Your national recognition indicates to me that this moment is long overdue. Please take to the stage. Dame Jo De Silva, for innovation in sustainable design. If you were listening to Desert Island Disc last week, you already know all about Dame Jo De Silva. 
Joe has earned global recognition as an engineer and a disaster relief specialist who has applied her knowledge and expertise to improve safety, promote inclusivity, and enhance the resilience of communities, cities, and infrastructure all around the globe. Born in Washington, D.C., she studied engineering at Cambridge before, in, before joining the world-renowned Arup Group as a graduate engineer. Having worked on key projects such as Czech Blackcock Airport and the National Portrait Gallery, she rose to become the Global Director of Sustainable Development. Having worked in refugee camps in Tanzania in the 1990s, Jo began to work extensively in crisis and disaster areas. This included assisting the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Sri Lanka after the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, where she helped coordinate the efforts of over 100 humanitarian agencies and the building of over 60,000 shelters in six months. In 2007, she founded the not-for-profit Arab International Development. Jo has shown a steadfast commitment to excellence, reducing suffering and improving social outcomes through working with communities to directly improve public health, safety and the quality of life for millions of people. Awarded an OBE in 2011, she was made a Dame Commander of the British Empire earlier this year. Jo, your significant achievements have already been widely recognised. You remind us of the power of design to create a better and more equitable world. Thank you. Please take to the stage. <laughs> Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Anthony and Fiona are partners in the design studio Dunn and Raby. They each hold the title of University Professor of Design and Social Inquiry at the New School of Design Parsons in New York. Together, they have used design to explore how alternative values, belief systems and ideals can be made tangible through the design of everyday objects. They cleverly interweave elements of design, art, science, technology and philosophy, helping stimulate discussion and debate amongst designers, industry and the public about the social, cultural and ethical implications of existing and emerging technologies. In so doing, they help create positive social change. Dunn and Raby have accumulated a massive and diverse amount of work, much too great to list here. But their exhibitions at renowned locations such as MoMA, the Centre Pompidou and the V&A have acted as catalysts to get people thinking about how everyday life can be organised differently around technology. Having published several books, including the internationally acclaimed Speculative Everything, they have had a significant impact not only on design education, but also on industry. Anthony and Fiona, you have influenced the work of countless designers over the past three decades and will continue to do so for future generations. We recognise and celebrate your immense contribution. Many congratulations. And now to Nick Foster for Innovation in Futures Design. Nick Foster is a designer, creative leader and futurist based in California. Currently the head of Designer X, formerly known as Google X, the home of Alphabet's Moonshots. He leads an amazing multidisciplinary team developing world-changing technology. Widely regarded as a pioneer in the emerging field of futures design, Nick combines industrial interaction, speculative design practice with strategy, communication and visualisation. His work, whilst mostly hidden from view, transforms nascent technologies into real-world solutions helping to shape our future. Leading over a hundred engagements in fields such as robotics, biotechnology, machine intelligence and prosthetics, we are only now beginning to see the global impact of his ideas. These include Waymo, robotic self-driving vehicles that aim to address the 38,000 people who die every year in road accidents in the US, and Loon, a system of balloons that fly over remote locations 
to deliver broadband connectivity to the one billion people still not on the internet. Nick devotes a significant amount of his time to education and lecturing around the world and is a visiting professor at the RCA here in London. Nick, the future of humanity and the planet we live on has never needed positive visions for the future more than now. Your work shows how we can use technology to create positive social and environmental change. Please uh, collect your diploma. Demis Asabis for innovation in artificial design. A designer, researcher and neuroscientist, Demis is the co-founder and CEO of DeepMind, the world's most progressive AI research company. A child chess prodigy, he studied computer science at Cambridge and cognitive neuroscience at UCL. Initially working in the field of video games, he co-designed and programmed the award-winning game Theme Park, which went on to sell over 10 million copies. Publishing many groundbreaking research papers on memory recall and imagination, he co-founded DeepMind in 2010. Demis has led the development of many groundbreaking technologies, including AlphaGo, the first program to beat a world champion at the complex game of Go, neural networks that learn how to play video games, and a neural Turing machine that mimics the short-term memory of the human brain. He and his team have also applied their knowledge to medical science, by example, partnering with Moorfields Eye Hospital to identify the early onset of degenerative eye conditions and through AlphaFold, which has finally cracked the problem of predicting the 3D shape of proteins, improving our understanding of disease and accelerating drug discovery. They also carry out extensive research into safety and ethics in AI. An advisor to the UK government since 2018, he was a participant in SAGE in response to the COVID pandemic. He was awarded a CBE in 2018. Demis, you have said whether AI will be good or bad depends on how society uses it. You have clearly demonstrated through your creative skills how to use it for good. Michael Wells for innovation in ecological design. Michael Wells is an ecologist and er eco-urbanist. He has spent over 30 years working at the interface between ecological science and human endeavor. A tenacious ecologist with exceptional imagination, he bridges the worlds of ecological science and design. Graduating from Cambridge, the fragility and resilience of nature became his lifelong passion. His company, Biodiversity by Design, is widely recognized as a pioneering consultancy that designs for all species, not just for humans. Working closely with many acclaimed designers, Michael has contributed ecological design thinking to award-winning schemes from all around the world, from regional environmental strategies to new eco-quarters in cities to buildings that fully integrate biotic habitats. Projects of note include the Tidal Terraces and Ecology Park at the Greenwich Peninsula and Habitats of the Olympic Village in Stratford. Further afield, he has worked in the Endo Rompin National Park in Malaysia and the islands of Sentosa and Pula Brani in Singapore. Co-authoring the UK's first national guidelines on ecological impact assessment, he has contributed to many influential publications, including the Handbook for Urban Ecology. Michael. You have shifted the perception of the emerging field of ecological design from a peripheral consideration to a driving force in design definition of whole projects. Many congratulations on becoming an RDI. And now to Marina Willer for innovation in graphic design. It is highly likely you will have already encountered Marina's work. 
A graphic designer and filmmaker, she studied at the RCA before joining the world-famous agency Wolf Olins, where she became a creative director. She joined Pentagram in London in 2012. Marina has designed major identities for many well-known organisations, including the Tate, South Bank Centre, Amnesty International, Oxfam and Macmillan Cancer Support. She led the rebrand to Battersea Dogs and Cats Home and has designed exhibitions for the Barbican Centre and Design Museum, including the popular Stanley Kubrick exhibition in 2019. Importantly, Marina has dedicated much of her time to addressing social issues through her work, influencing the way that many charities have embraced graphic design and branding as a very powerful tool. Marina is also a filmmaker, and her first feature film, Red Trees, is a personal story about her family's survival of the Nazi occupation of Prague and their escape to Brazil. In these times of refugees experiencing t intolerance and xenophobia, it is a celebration of diversity and hope. Premiered at Cannes in 2017, it was released worldwide by Netflix in 2018. She is an external examiner at the RCA and was named one of Creative Review's Creative Leaders in 2017. Marina, your incredible work with its strong social conscience makes you a very worthy addition to the Faculty of Royal Designers for Industry. Please come up and collect your applause. I will now read the citations for the Honorary Royal Designers for Industry 2021. This title is awarded annually by the RSA to non-UK designers of all disciplines who have achieved sustained design excellence, work of aesthetic value and significant benefit to society. Pete Udolf for Innovation in Landscape Design. Pete Udolf is an internationally renowned Dutch landscape designer, nurseryman and author. He creates magical landscapes and gardens. Pete prioritises the seasonal lifestyle of a plant over decorative considerations, seeing a garden as exciting when it looks good throughout the year. Considered a, considered a renegade, he pioneered the new perennials movement, using prairie style perennials and ornamental grasses, leaving everything up over the winter for the elegance of dieback. His, he first discovered his passion for plants having travelled to England in the 1970s but he now lives and works in Hummelo, a tiny visit village in East Netherlands, where he started a nursery with his wife Anya in the 1980s. Their garden has become world famous for its radical approach and ideas about planting. Pete's extensive portfolio includes a number of high profile designs and his most influential works include the Lurie Garden inside the Millennium Park in Chicago and New York's famous High Line. Pete has in achieved international acclaim including being awarded an honorary fellowship from the RIBA and the Prince Bernard Cultural Foundation Award, a major award in the Netherlands. He is also a highly successful author, having co-written numerous books that have helped transform countless gardens and public landscapes over the past 20 years. Now, unfortunately, Pete is unable to be here in person, so I'd like to invite his very good friend, Rosie Brown, to collect the award on his behalf. Thank you, Rosie. Neri Oxman for innovation in biodesign. Neri Oxman is an American Israeli architect, designer, inventor, and researcher, and founder and CEO of Oxman. Her approach and philosophy lie at the intersection of culture and nature, the unification of the made and the grown. From tree bark shells to silkworm webs and human breath, nature shapes both Neri's design and production process. Born and educated in Israel, she studied medicine before switching to architecture in London. She then joined the MIT Media Lab in 2005 and founded the Mediated Matter Group in 2010. There she pioneered the field of material ecology, fusing technology and biology. 
Over her career, Neri has developed new ways of thinking about materials, objects and buildings, creating frameworks for interdisciplinary and even interspecies collaborations. Whilst individually her works are absolutely beautiful and revolutionary, together they put forward a new philosophy of making and even unmaking the world around us. In addition to over 150 scientific publications and inventions, her work has been included in international museum collections, including a monograph show at MoMA New York. She has also been recognised by the World's Economic Forum. Unfortunately, Neri too is unable to be here in person to join us, and she has therefore asked Charlie Payton RDI to collect her award on her behalf. Thank you, Charlie. Paula Scher for Innovation in Graphic Design. Paula Scher is best described as a legendary, a legendary graphic designer, painter and educator. She is a principal at Pentagram in New York. She has been a pioneering force in American graphic design for the past five decades. Born and educated in the US, she began her career as an art director in the publishing and record industries before running her own studio. Her eclectic approach to typography is highly influential straddling the line between pop culture and fine art, whilst her work in signage and environmental graphics has reimagined streets and buildings as dynamic installations of type. Paula has developed many groundbreaking identity and branding systems, environmental graphics, packaging and publication designs, many of which have become landmarks of modern design. Paula devotes 25% of her time to pro bono work, arguing that in return for not charging clients, she can more easily work with them as a partner. Her amazing projects for the Public Theatre New York for over 25 years exemplifies not only her creating vision, creative vision but also her generosity. Paula has been the recipient of hundreds and hundreds of industry awards and honours, including the profession's highest honour in the US, the AIGA Medal in 2001. Her work is in the permanent collection of MoMA, the Library of Congress and the Victoria and Albert Museum. She is also a very accomplished artist who is exhibited worldwide. Paula, this is long overdue. We are truly delighted and grateful that you have taken the time from your busy schedule to come over from the US despite being Thanksgiving. Please join us on the stage. Marina Tabison for Innovation in Architecture. Marina is an architect, educator and principal architect of Marina Tabison Architects. Born and educated in Bangladesh, she is widely regarded as an ambassador for the culture and architecture of her country. Marina has achieved international renown, establishing a language of architecture that is contemporary but rooted to place, informed by climate, context, culture and history. Her best known work is the Beit Uruf Mosque, Dhaka, which won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2016. A refuge of spirituality, it is critically acclaimed both for its beautiful use of natural light and for challenging the status quo of a traditional mosque. For many years, Marina has engaged with local communities in the Sudarbans, an area within the Ganges Delta that it's unique and it has a unique ecology and is home to many poor people whose homes are regularly flooded. She has helped to develop construction skills based on craft techniques, working with communities to construct truly affordable homes. Marina has taught at many schools of architecture, including Harvard and the Technical University at Delft, and her many awards include the Gold Medal of the French Academy of Architecture and an honorary doctorate from the Technical University of Munich. Marina, we are truly delighted that you are able to be with us in person tonight. Your beautiful work not only represents the very highest standards in sustainable architecture, but you are also a fantastic role model to young architects the world over. Please take to the stage.
Well, many congratulations again to all our new RDIs. It's fantastic to have you as part of our faculty. I now get to say a very few brief words about my time as master. You'll, you'll be relieved because I'm sure you're, you're, you're fed up with hearing my voice already. When I gave my address two years ago, I undertook to work with my colleagues on our committee and the members of our association to deliver a number of things. Firstly, to expand a range of disciplines within the faculty, particularly in emerging fields. Secondly, to improve our reach and communication. And finally, to work more closely with the RSA than ever before. I'm very happy to say that despite the limitations of lockdown and the pandemic, we have managed to achieve all three. The diversity of disciplines of our new RDIs, I think, speaks for itself. As for improved communication, we have invested in a wonderful new website containing detailed information on each and every royal designer. You will all be on it tomorrow. The problem provides a the pr this provides a platform from which we can build and reach out to a wider audience, particularly to those interested in creative education. As for our work with the, with the RSA, we have stepped up our collaboration. And I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Joanna Chukia, Director of Design and Innovation, and Andrea Kershaw, Trustee, for their continuing support. Finally, some very brief thanks to Tom Gould, RDI, for this year's design, and Malcolm Garrett, RDI, for the excellent presentation. Also, to everyone who's provided help and support over the last two years, sharing what can only be described as unusual times. I do not have the time to name everyone individually but you all know who you are. But suffice it to say, nothing we have achieved would have been possible without a team effort. And so, to my successor and his RDI address. Tom Lloyd is an industrial designer and founding partner with Luke Pearson RDI of the London design practice Pearson Lloyd. From their base in Hackney, East London, their studio uses design to tackle environments that have demanding spatial, ergonomic and social needs creating work that sits at the intersection between object, service and space. Tom was made an RDI in 2008. He was chosen to succeed me on the basis not, not, not only is he an incredible designer who all of us admire and respect, but he has real ambition for continuing change within the faculty. Tom has great drive, energy and passion, and I have no doubt at all that he will prove to be an exceptional master. Now, I will now hand over this splendid badge of office and then leave you in his capable hands. So, Tom, let's do the dance. <laughs> okay, let's try this. It's complicated. And he's much taller than me. All set? All set, just the microphone. There you go. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Now, there are three glasses of water here, and I'm not sure which one has been drunk, so... OK, take the middle one. <laughs> COVID, here's to COVID. Thank you, Mark. So, my title tonight of the talk is Making Sense, Making Progress. As you can imagine, I have been thinking a great deal about this presentation. Firstly, I've been reflecting on my privilege. I'm privileged to come from five generations of architects, artists and makers from the arts and crafts furniture maker Arthur Rumney Green and his brother, the architect William Curtis Green, to my artist, artist mother, Jane, and architect father, Sam Lloyd. My dad, who was architect to the RSA for many years, redeveloped the RSA vaults in the 1980s. As a 15-year-old, I visited Robin and Lucien Day's extraordinary home and studio in Cheney Walk with dad to review a chair designed by Robin for the vaults. And I can vividly remember the chain mail screens, the corduroy covered polyprop dining chairs, and the drawings scattered across tables. 
Throughout my life, I have been immersed in a rich vocabulary of thinking and making. I face none of the barriers to becoming a designer that so many others do, and I know how lucky I am. I'm privileged, too, to be amongst this extraordinary group of people and to be invited to guide the faculty in the coming two years. Thank you for putting your trust in me. I've also been reflecting on my own professional career and the 25 years working with Loop, without whom I would not be here today. When we started out, we were truly innocents, childlike in our optimism, enthusiasm and knowledge. Hopefully, we've maintained some of those traits even to this day. To prepare for this evening, I've been thinking deeply and personally about what it means to be a designer today. Given the challenges that we all face, how can we make sense of the shifting priorities, values and vocabulary of our world and make progress in our response to the great issues of our time, including resource depletion, inequality and climate breakdown? Homo sapiens play an utterly dominant part in what is now controversially known as the Anthropocene Epoch. As with any natural system, humanity's evolution and development is a constant process of input and output, action and reaction as cohabitants of the natural world. This epoch has been so named because for the first time in Earth's history, our actions are putting now unbearable strain on the habitat that we share and that we depend on for life. As both designers and humans, we are participants in this system and never more critically than now. These two images are both shocking and sad to me and so expressive of the challenges we face today. Why is it that somehow we disconnect our own contribution to this reality through the acquisition of our new kitchens and bicycles and books stored in those containers and the plastic lodged in that bird's stomach. Hopefully, the blocking of the Suez Canal by the stranded evergreen may in future be seen as a watershed moment in drawing our attention to the realities of global production and consumption that we have become so accustomed to. So I want to talk, to this, e talk this evening about change and our role as designers in responding to and leading change in the world. Periods of rapid and unexpected change have been witnessed throughout our history. During the great horse manure crisis of 1894, the city of New York was brought to a near standstill by the byproduct of an estimated 200,000 horses living and working in the city. 1,000 tonnes of manure were deposited onto the streets every day, rat infested and disease ridden. Horses that died in the street were left to rot where they fell so that they could be more easily dismembered for removal weeks later. The mayor of the city organised an emergency town planning conference to try to solve the problem, but none was found or proposed. However, in a matter of 15 years, the city was transformed by the emergence of the motor vehicle into a place of cleanliness and modernity. At that moment, Henry Ford, creator of the Model T, and its design and engineering had heroic status. These two images of Fifth Avenue are only 13 years apart, but one shows only horse-drawn carriages and the other only motor vehicles driving down the same avenue. For decades hence, the car was an optimistic and aspirational path to our future, a symbol of progress and freedom. But as we now know, with great misfortune, the impacts of this one hopeful, once hopeful development have become both harmful and hurtful to us all. Today, our lived experience is constantly changing. We are witnessing new ways of doing and new rituals that surprise and challenge our sense of what is right and true. COVID has upended all our daily lives and in the process is acting as a trigger of transformation in the world. Cities are being reshaped, communication redefined, work reimagined, and just perhaps the pandemic will be a catalyst for more radical system change 
that nature now demands. I want to share just a few pieces of our work that on reflection illustrate changes in our process and practice over the last 25 years. When Luke and I started working together in the late 90s, we were professionally still wet behind the ears, figuring out how to find a client, how to work with engineers, how to unlock the riddle of a brief, how to add value to the users of our products. But we were enthusiastic, energetic and, and hardworking and helped along by our networks, contacts and friendships. In our very first year, in 1997, we designed a mobile work caddy for the furniture brand Knoll. The product addressed the very earliest transition to what was then called hot desking to make the most of the opportunities afforded by the emergence of the laptop. Homer, as it was named, was developed in a matter of six months and launched with great pride. We were truly delighted. The design made the most of the network of small factories across northern Italy that worked together in the service of the furniture industry. What we knew at the time, and actually accepted without challenge, was that we used just about every material and technology available to us. MDF, fabricated steel, extruded and turned aluminium, extruded PVC and moulded nylon. We worked tirelessly to conceal all fixings from the user, with no sense of disassembly, repair or recycling. It was a true product of its time. Ten years later, in 2007, the studio was commissioned to design new street furniture and wayfinding for the city of Bath. With a requested lifespan of 40 years, we developed a response that includes zero refinishing, easy repair and complete circularity of production. Sand cast bronze frames and armrests are designed to polish with age. Hardwood slats, which can be machined by any wood shop, are bolted into place with visible fixings and naturally weather over time. A few weeks ago, I visited the city for the first time in a decade and was delighted to see things how, how things are going with polished bronze and sun-bleached slats. The council, happily, now intends to permanently embed procurement of this bench into their street, streetscape design process. In 2018, a new Danish startup called TACT commissioned the studio to design a self-assembly timber stacking chair. TACT are committed to developing affordable, sustainable, high-quality timber furniture purchased online and assembled at home. Flat pack postage reduces transport carbon expenditure by 80%. All parts can be replaced by the owner on an individual basis to allow for repair and reuse. TACT publishes the embodied carbon of every part of the production and distribution process for full transparency. The chair is quiet and classical, but the system that surrounds it is utterly new and responsive to the challenges of today. Finally, just two weeks ago, we launched our latest range of products, designed in collaboration with a long-term Austrian partner, Bene, and London 3D print startup, Batchworks. The collection is made from a single material, 3D printed in London and other hubs in Europe, using locally sourced, 100% recycled, post-consumer waste bioplastic, that's a long sentence, such as cornstarch. Printed to order as single parts, the collection, Be Friends, eliminates the need for hard tooling, warehousing, assembly, long distance freight and all fossil fuel based materials. The system is in place for customers to return their products directly to the producer to be reground and reprinted at the end of their life. From Homer in 1997 to Be Friends in 2021, the processes and systems surrounding these designs could not be more different and tell some of the story behind the changes taking place in design for manufacture in that time. Discussions around why and how we make appropriately are now part of every working day. The models of production, distribution, ownership and consumption are all in flux. By the way, that is not to say we are perfect. Sectors, products and industries that we continue to work in are filled with compromise, inefficiency and practices that we need to change. But I honestly believe that design can take a leadership role in the transition to a more balanced and equitable system. In the last month, and coinciding with COP26, the brilliant Design for Planet conference at the V&A Dundee, and the launch of the Design Museum's Future Observatory, 
marks new elements of design thinking and exploration in our future. Alongside these initiatives and the RSA's Regenerative Futures Workstream, where does the RDI faculty sit and to what purpose? Through the concept of sustained excellence, the mark of an RDI by inference reflects a long-term dedication to practice as a benchmark of quality. However, in the context of rapid change, perhaps the relevance of past practice should not be the only signifier of excellence. To fully acknowledge both the challenges that we face and the response to those challenges, how can the faculty engage with emerging practice and practitioners that today may be in their infancy? As a faculty, I believe we need to establish more fruitful links to the future of our practice as well as to what is present and what is in the past. How too can we act in ways to diversify our intake, expand our reach and better reflect and represent the world we aim to serve? I've also been thinking about the concept of value. Through the history of design, a common narrative has existed around the theme of added value. Perhaps most readily associated with designers such as Raymond Lowy, honorary RDI, by the way, in the mid-20th century. The value that design brought to a product related to making manufactured things more desirable, more efficient, more sellable, and of course more profitable. We now understand the impact of unfettered consumption that this has played its part in, and need to re-evaluate our contribution to the physical world that we inhabit. The very building blocks of our relationship with the built environment and the vocabulary of design is being rewritten as we speak. From novelty to longevity, from linear to circular, from extractive to regenerative, from exclusive to inclusive, from owned to shared, from designed to co-designed, from human-centred to nature-centred. Each one of these polarities raises questions and challenges for our own practice and in turn is rebuilding the vocabulary of design and manufacturing. Could it be while the, that the, while the role of design today remains to add value, it is simply that the value proposition needs to be redefined and reordered? Design is a flexible craft. Amongst many things, we are researchers, opportunists, optimists and entrepreneurs, makers, thinkers, tinkerers, communicators, and above all, synthesizers. We are good at managing complexity. The brief is being rewritten, and it is up to all of us to respond. The design industry, just in the UK, consists of 200,000 businesses, 95% of which contain under 10 people. So alongside the giants of industry and consultancy, we are mostly a tribe of micro-business, with countless relationships and countless ways of making a difference. It may be that marginal gains in these small organisations will perhaps be more meaningful than a single idea in solving our present and future challenges. The practice of design is as much as anything about how we respond to the world, social, cultural and political. So as our world changes, so our response needs to change. I want to finish with a snapshot of the work of the new RDI and honorary RDIs that we welcomed into the faculty tonight. From systems to ecosystems, from understanding to communicating, from growing to making, they represent the extraordinary breadth of what design now is and how it can contribute to a better world. I hope we that we can continue to reflect and celebrate the power of design and advocate for its relevance and the positive contribution to, what to, to our collective futures that I know it can make. And I look forward to representing you as master to explore further the role of all of us as Royal Designers for Industry can have and inspiring and nurturing designers of the future. Thank you and an extraordinary thank you. Thank you. Stage left. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. What an extraordinary, indeed, call to action. Uh, it really does set out just how much 
there is to do and so much that design needs and must do and so much potential in the RDI. So thank you so much, Tom. Thank you again to Mark Major um, and uh, congratulations to all of the new uh, honorary and RDIs uh, this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to close up this evening before we move on. I'd also like to make some special thanks, uh, please, to the RSA staff who have made this event possible tonight. Uh, that's to Ade Popula, uh, to Alex Lucas, to Gillian Linton, Aoife Adokati, <laughs> Kelly Davis from the RSA. Thank you. And uh, just some small instructions before we finish up. Can I please ask the new RDIs to stay behind here uh, in this room? We're going to assemble for a photograph. Um, and uh, everybody else, uh, RDIs and your guests, if you can please make your way to the Benjamin Franklin room, uh, where we are indeed going to meet our student designers and have the chance to have a look at their work. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thanks to everyone at home.